Okay. All right. Welcome back. Here we are, the last little bit. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about scraping planes. So the scraping plane is probably um, one of the tools that we have that causes the most amount of consternation uh, because uh, people have trouble setting them up to use properly. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to set them up in order to get good results. So <clears throat> I treat a scraping plane very similarly to a hand plane. So um, we've used card scrapers before, I'm sure. And card scrapers, um, typically, you know, you joint them with a file. We have a jig, right, that holds the file so that you can do a nice um, uh, angle on there, a nice 90 degree angle. And then you can take that card and then put it edge down on a water stone and then you can get rid of the file marks and then uh, turn a hook and all of that other stuff. Um, but with a, with a joiner, or with, sorry, with a scraping plane, you need to uh, approach things a little bit more, more differently. And it's more differently. Wow. How did I, yeah, isn't that great? That's Canadian English for you right there. <sighs> Anyhow, um, there are going to be bits edited out, right? No. <laughs> especially that boo-boo you made earlier. Uh. Oh, yeah, especially the wife comment I made, right? Yeah. <laughs> Dear. Okay, so I treat this blade. Now you can get a couple of different blades for this. You can get a thinner blade and then you can get a, a more stout blade. I like the more stout blade personally because I find that because I treat it more like a plane blade, it acts more like a plane blade. Um, so uh, this has a 45 degree bevel on it. And when you're using the thinner plane blade or the thinner blade, you can actually use this at the 45 degree setting and joint that with it, right? There's also, it also acts more like a card scraper in the sense that it can be bent. And so there's a screw at the back here that allows you to bend that blade so that it's more like a card scraper, okay? In the case of the thicker blade, however, you don't need to use that in order to have it function properly. One of the things, however, bending the blade does is it gets the corners out of the work. And we probably know with uh, bench planes that it's important <laughs> to put a bit of camber on the blade in order to disengage those corners. Okay? Otherwise, you get these horrible steps in your work and then you get frustrated and you grab a sander and then, you know, you're no longer, you're not having fun anymore. Right? So, um, in this case here, this gets treated just like any other blade iron. And so I'm going to put it into the jig. I'm going to set it to 45 degrees, right? I'm going to put a little bit of camber on the blade, right? So that I don't have to worry about the corners getting into the work, right? Now, in the case of this thick blade, some people will put a burr on this. What I'm talking about with the burr is... Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, right in front of me. Okay, so this is a burnisher, and basically all this is is a tool that is harder than the scraper itself. Okay, and when you turn a burr, basically all you're doing is deforming the metal to create a little bit of a hook. Okay, in the case of a card scraper, you want to put just a light hook on there, you don't want to put a heavy one because the more curl that that steel has, the thinner it is out here, and then the more work hardened it becomes, and then it just breaks and fractures off, and then all you get is dust, right? I was taught years ago to hold the card scraper in my hand and put the burr on, because then you can't push down too hard, right? If you put it into a vise, lean on it. The first time I was taught, you know, you kind of put the burnisher down and you turn it at 45 degrees and raise it 10 degrees and then put the hook on. Well, that's way too much pressure, right? Because then you get what I call the tsunami hook, which is this massive, massive curl. And in order to use that, then you have to basically lean the scraper right down in order to engage that cutting edge, right? Which isn't comfortable, right? You want to be able to hold it 
pretty much straight up and down. In the case of the thinner blade for this plane, you can put a very fine hook on there uh, in order to get it to operate properly. In the case of this iron, I don't normally use it with a hook, okay? Because what I've done is I basically prepared this back and bevel the same way I have done a plane blade, okay? But what the real, what the real action is that people get confused with is that this has an adjustable holder for the blade, okay? So you can see here, I can loosen this off, right, and have this come forward, or I can have it come back, and it will hold the blade at a different angle, okay? So what I need to do is, well, what angle do you put it at? Well, this is the problem when you start getting into putting a camber on something, because when you, or so, pardon me, when you put a hook on something, because you're going to put a hook on it may be 5 degrees, it may be 10 degrees, you know, it's hard to tell. So the reason why you have that adjustability is to make up for that. And so the part that people don't do is that they take a blade and they put it onto a piece of hard timber that they're going to use. And the, what you want to do is you want to push it until and hold it at the angle where you get shavings. So I'm getting shavings at this angle. Okay? So now... I look at that and I say, yeah, that's good. Now I have to mimic that in the body. Okay? Now, you could measure it. Okay? <laughs> you will drive yourself insane. <laughs> Don't do that. So, now what I do is I slide this into the blade and I look at it and I go, is that where it was? Nope. No, it's too tilted too far forward, isn't it? So now, I'm going to adjust this. Maybe a bit more. Does anybody remember? <laughs> so once I get it to what I think is where it should be, right, then I tighten up the other one and those two lock together, right? Another thing that people tend to do is there's this information where you're meant to put a piece of paper on here and then put this on top and then that sets how far your blade sticks out. So does anybody know how thick a piece of paper is? <laughs> right, right, but generally I think... <laughs> No. <laughs> Listen, I asked the question. I, you know, it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, generally, it's around four thousandths of an inch, right? Human hair kind of thickness, right? And so, four thousandths of an inch is a massive setting for a scraper plane, because you already need a little bit extra horsepower. To push this through because now your blade is tilted forward and it's a much more difficult cut. So I always say to just drop the blade in, you know, so that it's resting on the work and then tighten this up, okay? And then you'll probably notice that it'll cut already, okay? Now I also look and see where that's cutting, okay? Right now it appears that it's cutting higher on the right hand side than the left, right? So I'm just going to take something and give it a little knock. I know. Brass on steel, it's horrible, I know. It's all right, we'll be okay. Okay, and then now I've got a cutting in the center. So what I'm aiming for is to get shavings, not dust. If I get dust, something's wrong. Now typically what's wrong is that the blade is not prepared properly. So in this case here, this got treated like a plain iron. You very rarely have trouble getting these to work properly. It's usually the ones where you actually turn a burr on that you start to have a little bit of trouble because you've got to go from 
spotting where you're getting the shaving to where that actual angle is. Now on a regular card scraper, we don't have problems with that because we do the adjustment on our own, right? You feel where you're getting the best cut and then you just hold it in that position and away you go. Which is great for a card scraper, but a card, uh, card scraper doesn't have a soul, right? You don't have something that's going to keep things flat. And if you're working this bit of ash here, like this is pandemonium going on on this piece of wood, right? You've got a bit here which uh, some serious reversing grain and then this was part of the crotch of the tree and so that is a nightmare to hand plane, right? So having something that has a sole, if you wanted to, this would make a, you know, imagine if you had this piece as a drawer front and you'd split this open and then book matched it. Oh my goodness, would that ever be impactful as far as a, as, as a drawer front. But you might be scared to death of doing that because then you would have to surface this, right? So in the case of the scraping plane, it makes, it really does make it quite easy. Okay, now that's, this is nasty. Like that's a nasty bit of, so I would go the other way here. Okay, now you're never going to get as good a surface with this as you will with a hand plane. Okay, the Japanese taught us that the lower the angle you can work at, the better. Because if you have a nice low angle, you're really going to shear the wood fibers. Right, the higher you go, Right? It's still better than sanding, right? but it's, it's going to make less of a good surface. Right? So in this case here, we're getting lovely shavings, right? and a lot of these are end grain shavings when you think about it, because the crotch of the tree when it's split like this, right, this is going in all different directions and that's what gives us a beautiful figure. Right? But you're essentially trying to plane end grain here. And so for a scraping plane to be able to scrape across that and produce shavings is, is really impressive, right? I'm not saying I'm impressive, I'm just saying the tool can do it, right? I'm just the tool using the tool, right? So to me that's the most common problem people have with this plane, is figuring out what angle they should have this set to. And there's no, there's no rule of thumb, there's no um, there's no kind of, you know, if you have it here, you know, it's good. If you have it here, it's better. It really depends on the iron that you're using, right? The nice thing about this, with this plane, if you're doing inlay work, let's say you've inlaid a nice little fan that is made out of ebony and holly, right? If you sand that, you're going to migrate all of the black dust into the holly, and then you're going to have gray, which is not what you're after, right? You're looking for that nice, crisp difference between the colors. Scraping will allow you to do that. Now, this is a big plane, right? If you're doing a big drawer front or something, then this makes a lot of sense. We also have a smaller scraper um, that I find is a little bit better suited for doing inlay work and that sort of thing. But the beauty of the plane is, is that it allows you to maintain a good cut and maintain flatness of the material. Because if you work at an area too much with a card scraper and you hold it up to the light, you see that, right? And then if you really want to see it, add finish. <laughs> because then it, then it just sits there and stares at you and yells every time, say, hey, look at me, I'm not flat. Right, and then you got to explain that to your woodworking friends and you know what they're like. <laughs> <laughs> Most critical, aren't they? Yeah. <coughs> so, the nice thing about this particular burnisher, this is called a tri-burnisher, and if you see in profile there, it's kind of got a teardrop shape to it. Ideally, with a scraping tool, um, you want to use the biggest surface of the burnisher to give you your burnished edge. So, in the case of a flat um, card scraper, you're going to use this big flat area. But if you have one of those whale tail shaped ones and you need to use the inside curve, well now you can use this thin bit and get it in there and, and turn that, that hook over, right? Um, there's other things that you can use as burnishers, right? 
So you have screwdriver, old screwdrivers. They have to be old ones. New ones, they're soft all the way until the tip, right? Um, I've heard of using chisels. Mm. I'm not going to do that with my Veritas chisels. You can do them with yours, but <laughs> so I mean, having a tool for the job is nice. The nice thing about this is it's highly polished, which means that you're not going to get any catches as you put your put your burrs on, right? And it's to me, it's less about the numbers, right? We we always talk about prescribed numbers, you know, five degrees, ten degrees, you know, what have you. I mean, really, all you're trying to do is to get the steel to go from straight on to having a bit of a hook. That's it. You're not, you know what I mean? That's the, that's the fundamental thing that you're trying to do with the card scraper. If we assign numbers to it and all that other stuff, then we start to panic that maybe we don't have those numbers and then you end up, you know, getting into trouble. Yeah, yeah, we have a variable. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the variable burnisher is a tool that we have that basically slides over a card a card scraper and what it does is it holds the angle uh, to a specific number right so you can adjust the front of it and then say okay I want five degrees and then you run that across and what that does is it holds a piece of carbide inside the burnisher at precisely five degrees and then gives you that consistency yeah so if you're worried about the consistencies that's definitely um, a tool that can do do the trick That, that scraper plane with a thicker blade in mm. that doesn't need any angle on it. Oh, sorry, does need any burr on it at all. You just yeah. I mean, some people do put a burr on it. I t typically don't because then I find it's too aggressive. Yeah. And quite frankly, I'm just going to ruin what I put on there yeah. with with the sharpening because that will literally be like a hair shaving, fingernail sticking sharp blade in there as opposed to just a, you know, a card scraper kind of situation. Yeah. Where would you use that rather than just lowering the gas plane with a plane? Yeah, um, again, because I'm always trying to hand plane with um, the lowest possible angle I can, if I put a 25 degree blade into my joiner or into my jack plane and I'm getting tear out, then I'll switch to a high ang higher angle blade. I'll go up to maybe 35, maybe 40. Right, and then I'll try again. If I still am getting a little bit of tear out, then I'll go to a 50 degree blade, right? If I'm still getting tear out, right, then that's when I switch to the scraping plane, right? 50 degrees, 50 degree blade in this plane gives you an effective cutting angle of 62 degrees because the bed is 12 degrees, right? I would still rather that than scraping. But there are just some woods that are that are difficult. You look at woods like um, Sapele, right? Beautiful ribbon figure. But the problem is, is that this line, the grain is running this way. This line, the grain is running this way. This line, the grain. <laughs> you see where I'm going? Like, how could you possibly get this right? Because you're always going against the grain for part of the board. So in which case, there, something like this. Is beneficial right <laughs> other woods like babinga or rosewood were common problems of course nowadays it's going to be more and more difficult to get a hold of those woods because it's on the CITES list which means that it's making it more difficult to trade it's not CITES 1 it's CITES 2 which means that it's it's not forbidden but it makes it very difficult to um, um, to, to, to trade in it right so but those typical woods were very very difficult things like this uh, things like this crotch right hard ash right that's where you would use that because even with a 50 degree blade mounted in a in in a low angle um, jack you're still gonna have problems right so this is just gonna if you know it's nasty like this don't even bother just go right for the scraping plane right because all you'll do is frustrate yourself with this Okay. Any other questions about scraping planes? Yes, sir. Well, it's not quite about the scraping plane, but you, you were speaking as almost as if you use your, I'd call it number 62, 
right. for, for everything. You just swap the blades. That's right. Um, you, so you, you use that preferentially to more conventional bench planes Correct. for everything. Yeah, I use a, this is my most used plane in my shop because it's long enough that I can um, flatten surfaces, you know, 15 to 20 inches wide. Um, it allows me to also get nice clean shots on the joint, right? Um, I can also, it's not so long that I can't back it up a little bit and then use it as a smoother, right? I'm a lazy woodworker. So instead of walking three steps to my plane till and grabbing the, the smoothing plane, a lot of times I'll just back this off and then just carry on with what I'm doing and put a finish on it. Right. Do you, do you find you're using the low angle blade most of the time? No. No, I find I use the low angle blade most commonly for shooting, which is another use for this plane, right? We put it onto a shooting board on its side and then we can trim end grain with it. Um, a lot of, most times there's a, a 35 degree blade in here, which sits me at about 47 degrees, which is your common pitch, roughly. Okay, and then the 50 degree blade, which is higher angle for more difficult things like curly maple or bird's eye maple. Yeah, yeah. So the nice thing about a bevel up plane design is that you can do that, right? You can have, I have four different blades. I have a low angle, medium angle and high angle. And then I have a toothing blade, which allows me to remove material quickly especially material that is uh, highly figured because the fact that there's wood beside each one of the cuts it holds everything together so it doesn't tear out and then if I have a finely tuned uh, smoothing plane right then I can come along and just remove those high spots those high kind of corduroy areas and then bring it down to an even uh, surface and now I'm ready to go and that's, you picked up another low angle plane. Yeah. Yeah, all of my, all of my bench planes are low angle planes. Mine personally. Because that's just what I've gotten accustomed to using. So my jointer is a low angle jointer. Uh, or a bevel up jointer, if you will. This is a bevel up smoother. This is a bevel up plane. I've just come to, to use those more often. That, that is interesting, given that you have access to all the others. Right. right. That you end up using those. Yeah, well what it was is that when I was in school, I bought, um, actually my first plane was a Clifton, uh, which, which uh, is, is from Sheffield, isn't it Sheffield? Yeah, and so, but then I needed a high angle smoother because I was starting to work with some more difficult woods, and so the option was um, buy another plane, right? So there's another $300. So somebody at the school had said, you know, you may want to look at Veritas's bevel up line because you can just put different blades right into, uh, into the plane and get different cutting actions. So then I recognized, well, I can get a jointer, a jack and the smoother and they all take the same blade. So now you have three blades already. <laughs> So one gets, got set up as a jack, one got set up as a jointer, or pardon me, one, sorry, one as a low angle, one as a medium angle, one as a high angle, and then the toothing blade which fits in all of them, and now I've essentially got nine planes. So just as a starving student, um, which you, you wouldn't have guessed that looking at me, um, but it really, uh, it made sense to me. And so, and I've just never gone back to, to conventional planes after that. There's nothing wrong with conventional planes, there's nothing wrong with bevel down planes, but in the end it really comes down to personal preference, right? The wood doesn't know if it's a bevel up plane or a bevel down plane. If I have a Stanley plane that is holding a blade at 45 degrees and I have a bevel up plane with the proper angle that complements the bed angle to 45 degrees, it's essentially the same cut. So it just really boils down to personal preference at that point. And I already have these planes, so. If you bevel up or bevel down, Sorry? it must cut differently. No. No? No. No, there's no, no difference. difference. We studied that when we made our new custom bevel down plane line because 
um, we were experimenting with, with using a chip breaker and not using a chip breaker, right? And so what we discovered was is that um, a chip breaker needs to be very close to a cutting edge, like two thousandths of an inch close to a cutting edge in order to get the advantages of the, of the chip breaker. And what basically that does is it's artificially increasing the angle to whatever, you know, the chip breaker angle plus the, plus the bed angle, or pardon me, the frog angle, that gives you a certain, a certain, uh, a certain number. Um, in this case here, so we use, we tested our new bevel down line with no chip breakers. And in fact, you can use our custom line of planes without one because we've made the adjuster connect to the blade, not to the chip breaker, which is what typically you would find on a Stanley or a record. And so we tested it out without and it worked just fine. There wasn't a discernible difference in the surface of the wood. There was no more or less tear out. Um, so what it, what, it, what it showed was is that 45 degrees is 45 degrees, no matter how you slice it. No pun intended. <laughs> I do. Because I got one of those last week. And oh, I did, did you? Yeah. The instruction said set it to 38 degrees. So there's no 38 degrees. Right, there. right. That happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I always tell people that typically when we were doing testing, we found that there was the most discernible difference in, in performance at 10 degree increments. Okay, so for example, on our, on our bevel down line, uh, the new one, you can get a 40 degree frog, you can get a 45 degree frog, and then you can get a 55 degree frog. So um, 38, yes, it, it, there isn't a 38 mark on here, um, but there's a 40 mark. And two degrees, doesn't make a lot of difference. Actually, it, it makes no discernible difference. And in fact, practically, as a, from a woodworker standpoint, if I use a 45 and a 50, I don't notice a huge difference, if I'm being honest. But if I jump from 45 to 55, then I notice a difference in performance. So those small increments, you know, that, um, that you hear about, and it's like, well, I prefer my planes to be at 47.6 degrees. Well, come on. You know, it makes for interesting writing, but I don't think it, I don't think it, it does much in the way of practical, practical use. Maybe I'm just not refined enough. That's probably true. Coming from Canada. Yeah. <laughs> you can always find, find somebody, somebody to support you, can't you? <laughs> We're very precious here, you know. Yes, yes, I've noticed that. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, in that case, then just put a 40 on there. Yep. Yep. Oh, no, that's perfect. Yeah, and I mean that two degrees difference, you'll never miss it. Yeah. Can you um, set it lower and then use the um, the micro bevel adjuster on it? That's right. You could do that, and that would probably give you either an extra <coughs> angle. Yeah. Well, that might be what I do. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. When you say 40 degrees on that, by the time you've gone into the three o'clock and six o'clock position, it will lift it up by. <laughs> that's right yeah yeah I mean it's um, there's different ways to do it like personally when I sharpen and this is just me personally I put all I set all of my micro or pardon me all of my primary bevels I set to 24 degrees every one of them doesn't matter if it's meant to be a 50 degree blade or a 25 degree blade so I use a grinder and I grind it to 24 degrees. Then when it's time to put the, um, the secondary bevel or the micro bevel on, then I just simply set it. If it's meant to be a 30 degree blade, I set this to 30 and then stick that on and now I hone it at 30 degrees. So I don't actually use the micro bevel setting, but that's because I'm using a power grinder in order to get my primary bevels. And the reason I picked 24 is that with a 24 degree blade, I can put a 25, 35, 45, or 55, whatever I want on there, right? Because all I'm worried about is that very leading edge, okay? 
And because I'm using bevel up planes, those angles are very important. If you're using a bevel down plane, you can sharpen that thing anywhere between 25 and 35 and you're going to be okay. Right? You don't want to get much higher than that. You, don't, you certainly don't want it at 45, that's for sure. Because that will cause you some problems. Right? But the, but the idea here is that the reason I do it is because I'm lazy. <laughs> I, I have my grinder set. I don't even know if you could change the setting on the grinder, to be honest. I think it's probably just rusted in place. <laughs> and so I, whenever my micro bevel starts to creep halfway up the blade, then I just take it over there and I just bring it back down to my 24 degrees and then start over again. Because the micro bevel is only there, again, to speed up our sharpening, right? It's not doing anything else other than that. And then you get into the argument about, you know, uh, a hollow bevel or a hollow grind versus a flat grind and one is, uh, it's fine, right? Tormek machines are fine, grinders are fine, It'll all, it all does the trick, right? I'm more interested in, in woodworking, <laughs> quite frankly. If I wanted to, you know, worry about metal, I'd be a metal worker, you know. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Um, so, yeah, so that, yeah, so, to, so the long-winded answer is 40 is good, right? Um, and then uh, you, can, you can set it up however you want. If you don't have access to a power grinder, well, then the simplest thing to do is to do your primary bevel at, let's say you want a 30 degree blade, you do your primary bevel at 30 and then you pull out this knob and put it to the 6 o'clock position because this roller is, on an, is mounted eccentrically, it now bumps that up by about a degree or two. Okay, if you really need to know the number, right, it's in the instructions of what that actually gives you, right? It works out to be like 31 point something, right? But I go back to my old adage, who cares? Does it do what you need it to do? If so, it's the right angle. Okay? Um, so then once you crept up to halfway point with that setup, you can just go to a coarser stone and then put it back to the 12 o'clock position and that'll bring you back to the numbers that are on this jig and then that'll get you back uh, to starting over again. Okay? One of the advantages of bevel up planes that you haven't mentioned is that they usually have adjustable throats. Yes. Which a bevel down doesn't. Not always, and no. I just wonder how much you find yourself adjusting your throat. All the time. Yep. I adjust the throat all the time because what, what's happening is, is that when you're cutting, okay, you've got a blade and then you've got your throat in the front and it's pushing down on the fibers and your blade is right behind it okay and what's happening is is that that's pushing down on the fibers and that's holding them in place for the cut if you have this you know this is exaggerated obviously but if you have that wide open what can happen is is the blade goes in and then it starts to allow the wood to fracture ahead of the cut and that's what tear out is because then you just lever that chunk out and then you've got a big mess, right? And then you're in trouble. So if I'm doing coursework, then I just simply have to loosen this, open that all the way up and now I've got a really wide mouth, okay? Then I can loosen this and I can close it and I can even use this depth limiting knob here so that I don't smack it into the blade and then put a very tight mouth on there and then now I'm able to do super fine cuts. So as we talked about my lazy planing, right? I use this for rougher cuts. I have it open and I take the board down to flat and then I close it, back the iron off just a whisper and then now I'm doing a finishing cut on, the, on it. As well, when you take your blade out to sharpen, I always open the mouth wide open. I'm not worried about the blade coming out. I'm worried about it going back in. Right, because I've just sharpened it and now I don't want to smack that into the toe. So, um, all, I mean, bevel, to say bevel down planes don't have adjustable mouths isn't quite true. Um, the old Stanley planes, right, you could adjust the, the blade bed forward. Uh, the Lee Nielsen stuff, you can move it forward or back. Um, and then you can also do um, 
Uh, you can also do it on our bevel down planes as well. The, the, the one thing that is true is that this makes it very easy, right? It's just a twist of the wrist and you've got it locked into place and you're ready to work. So that's, yeah. For me, I use that all the time. That's a very, very important feature for me. I think the low angle planes are probably easier to set up. Up the angle. There's less bits of the chip breaker to worry about. Correct. It's just much simpler once you get used to using them. But quite a different feel. The handle shape's different, the weight is different where they are. So, mm -hmm. let me say to the guys here, try one out and try a standard plane and really yep. it's a personal decision what's best for you. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it really is a personal decision whether you do. Um, whether you do bevel up or bevel down, it's a, you know, it's a personal decision if you choose Veritas or, or Lee Nielsen, right? Lee Nielsen plane handles and everything feel differently than ours do, right? And you want to pick a plane that is going to feel comfortable in your hand because this could be in your hand for a long time, right? Not only for each individual job, but for the, for the length of time you spend woodworking. So it better feel comfortable, right? Um, so just to, um, just to, uh, sum up, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly show you the way I set up my hand plane so that uh, to work. And then, um, unless there's any other, I mean, I'll ask for questions afterwards as well. And is there anything else, Peter, that you would like to? No, I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just do a quick demo on how I, um, how I, where was that smaller board that had the, <coughs> ah yes. All right, so I'll just do a quick demo on how I set up my planes. So I've watched many, many woodworkers work because I could watch work all day to be quite frank. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. <laughs> so I'll just show you how I typically will set up a hand plane and now of course, if you're working on rough timbers, this method isn't perfect, but I think for the most part, a lot of us are using a combination of hand and power tools. And so if this has gone through a thickness, a joiner thicknesser, right, you're going to have a fairly um, smooth surface. But in the end, I think you'll see that this works well, whether using rough or, um, uh, or plain timber. So first things first, mouth gets wide open, okay, then I'm going to just advance the blade to a non-sensible cut. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look down the sole and what I'm trying to do is decide is one side of that blade sticking out further than the other. Okay? Now this is not by, this is by far not the, the final adjustment. This is just for me to get a rough idea. So right now it looks to me that it's sticking up a little bit high on the left hand side. So as with any hand plane, if you are going to adjust it, you're going to move the adjuster into the direction that it's cutting high. In this case, it's cutting high on the left, I feel, just visually. And so you can move it with your fingers, right? Or you can take something and just give it a bit of a tap. I like the tap method because it allows me to give very, very fine adjustments. It's also worth noting that I keep the chip breaker in, or sorry, the lever cap in place so I'm not loosening and tightening and loosening and tightening because every time I do that, it's going to change the position of the blade slightly and then I'm going to be chasing that around. So and the lever cap is tied, is screwed down very tightly. Well, not very tightly. Snug. Yeah, just tight enough. And so what does that mean, right? <laughs> okay, so do we get like a torque wrench? Right? <laughs> so basically what I do is I tighten it up until it, like I feel it stop and then just a little bit more. So what you're after is it's tight enough that the blade is not easily going to move around, but it's not so tight that I can't make blade adjustments to it. Okay? So you just kind of have to experiment with a little bit. If this moves around while you're hand planing, then it's too loose. If you can't turn that knob to make an adjustment, it's too tight. Okay, so you have to get it somewhere in between. So I look down the sole and I say, yeah, I, I'm pretty happy with that. And so now what I do is I dial the blade back so that it's not cutting. 
Now I come right up to my timber that I'm working with and I've got the blade backed off so it's not cutting at all. And then I'm going to slowly start to slide it forward and advance the blade until it starts to cut. Okay? So if you can see in the mouth, the shaving is almost centered. So because these blades have a little bit of camber to it, right, I want to see that in the center of the mouth. So it was a little bit high here, so what did I do? I, I adjusted it too much, didn't I? Because it was high over here. So which way do I have to move this? Correct. Okay, I've only got a thou or two of, of camber on here. So if I go to gangbusters with the adjustment, I'm going to be in trouble. So now I'm going to come back here again. And now I'm getting a shaving right in the center of the mouth. I'm getting the bulk of my thickness in the center of the shaving. And then it peters out to nothing. Not Peter Sefton's out to nothing, but peters out to nothing on the sides, which is what I'm after. Brilliant. So now this, is, this technique has taught me a couple of things. Number one, I know that the plane is centered. Number two, I know that I'm taking a fine shaving. Now this isn't the finest shaving. I'm going to dial it back and take a little bit less. But it basically gets you in the right neighborhood to start your planing routine. If I was going to flatten this board now, right, because it's got machine marks on it, Right? So now I would just take this and I would remove material until it's all the way across. And then now I've got that all sorted. Right? Now I close my mouth, back the blade off a whisper, okay? And then do that again. Okay, now that's, I got to move it just a bit more, because when you back the blade off, it kind of changes things a little bit. So you always have to do these little fine tuning bits. Now, okay, so that's about half a thou, if you're into measuring things. There's entire competitions. <laughs> <laughs> based on making the thinnest shaving you possibly can. <coughs> wow. <laughs> May I ask you, Vic, on that expensive plane, which part were you tapping, please? I was tapping the, uh, the you adjuster. You were tapping the adjuster? Yeah. So it's moving the blade. Yes. So by, it's like a tiller steer boat. Yeah. You push right to go left, yeah. right? You can hit the blade if you want, but there's not a lot of material there, yeah. right? Now, you're not meant to hit it. And when I say hit it, that sounds kind of crass. I'm not really hitting it more than gently caressing it <laughs> with a hard object. You don't want a home run, just a single. Yeah, you oh. just, <laughs> that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah. You can tell he's Canadian because he made a baseball reference, no, not a cricket reference. <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with cricket. So now I've got a super fine cut, and now I can take those planing marks out. So I've removed the machine marks, and then now I've used the plane to take the heavy, cam the heavy plane marks out. And I'm just working my way across the board. All right, so there again. I see you finish off with the center of the plane on the edge of the board as well to get it. That's there. right, yeah, because I've got to make sure I get all the way across. Okay, and then you can even take your shavings, ball them up, and burnish the surface. Why don't you just go into tissue production? <laughs> into what? <laughs> tissue production. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you could do. Okay, and then you get, now there's a little bit of a streaking going on. I think there's something, I think there's something on my plane. But that's not, that's not anything that would end up on, um, so we'll just put an X on the surface that I hand planed. And then you can feel the results you get with that. 
and so that's ready for finish. So if you were meant to sand that, 100 grit, 120 grit, 150 grit, 180 grit, 220, where do you stop? 600? <laughs> That's great. I know some people that stop at 2,000. <laughs> right? But the, the idea there is that that board's ready for finish, quite literally. And so it took me less than a minute to create that surface. Now, not every plane, not every board is going to take that, is, is going to do that well with it. But on the ones that do, it makes perfect sense to me. So just to reiterate, what I do is I open up the mouth all the way, increase the cut so that it's sticking right out of the bottom of the plane, look, see where it is. If it needs any preliminary adjustments, I do it. Back the iron off, put it right onto the timber, slowly push it forward whilst adjusting this at the back. As Soon as I see a shaving, I note where it is in the mouth. Once you see it in the mouth, make any final adjustments and go from there. Now, if you're working a timber that hasn't been machined, right, you're going to be having to guess a little bit because the wood is uneven. And so, but for the most part, your visual inspection of the plane iron is going to get you pretty darn close, right? I was just outside of center just from a visual inspection, right? And then, if you get it cleaned up and flat with a heavier cut, when you do go back to do your final pass, then make any slight tweaks to the blade, and then you're, you're going to have no problem. Okay? So it doesn't need to be difficult. And quite frankly, using hand planes is not difficult. If you can set up a table saw to make a cut, then you can use a hand plane. But the critical thing with anything with hand tools is sharpness. You need sharp metal. That's, that's, the, that's the cruel reality. And again, it's not difficult to sharpen, right? I was taught to sharpen by hand, right? I was taught that that was an important thing to know how to do. The sad part about it was as though when I didn't woodwork every single day anymore, I lost that muscle memory. And then what would happen is I would think I was doing a quick sharpening job, but then I would mess up the edge, and then I'd have 20 minutes of remedial work ahead of me to fix the edge. And then that's aggravating because, again, we all know how I feel about sharpening, right? I don't like doing it, but I have to do it. You wear your tools away. That's right, yeah, and you wear your tools away, you know, when you, when you make mistakes like that. This means that every single time I pull this blade out, and this blade is sharpened to 30 degrees, if I put it in this jig, and I set it to 30 degrees, I'm going to get the proper result every time. I'm going to go right back to that micro bevel that I had set. And every everybody tells me that this thing is slow, right? I, so here we go. Put it on, set it to the right spot, take the blade out, Flip the jig over, slide it underneath, make sure that you've got the edge right up against the side and, or sorry, the side up against here, edge up against there, Inter go back and forth tightening, take off this jig, sharpen. Hand sharpeners tell me all the time, oh it's too slow, it's too slow, it's too slow. Do you need to be faster than that? Are lives dependent upon the, for the speed at which this blade is sharpened? <coughs> I'm going to say no. <laughs> so for me, setting that up in there takes no time whatsoever. I'm sharpened. I know I'm going to hit that very, very polished edge right there. I'm not guessing at angles. I'm not screwing anything up. And then once I get a little bit of a burr on the back, I can take the whole thing in the jig, take the burr off on the stone, and pull the blade out and go back to work. So you can't tell me this is slow. Again, the muscle memory is okay if you're doing 30 degrees, but now if you're doing 40 degrees or 50, right. 25, trying to remember all those is it's difficult. difficult. And that hits it every single time. Every single time. 
And I think if you're using nothing but bevel down planes, then I think you can get away with hand sharpening, absolutely. Because you're always sharpening the same angle. Or if there's a fluctuation difference, but I'll tell you what happens. When you hand sharpen, I'll t it, it, and listen, I used to hand sharpen, so I know what I speak of. What happens is you get it to a certain point, right? You think you've got your right angle, and you start to sharpen, right? And you're moving back and forth. The way I was taught is that you lock your elbows, and then just rock your body back and forth, and you get that angle. I come here, and I check to see if I have a burr. Nope, no burr. So that means I'm not at the right angle. So then I put it down and then I raise it a little bit. And then I go for it again, right? Back and forth, back and forth. Ah, there I have a burr, right? But eventually what you end up doing is you end up raising and raising and raising and raising until you're in trouble. Now with the bevel down plane, you get to a point where the angle is steeper than, than the plane bed and then now you're rubbing on the back of the bevel, not the front of the bevel, and then, all, then now what you've got is a wood burnisher, not a wood plane, right? In the case of a bevel up, I can't afford to do that. If this is a 25 degree blade, and I go to hand sharpen it, and I don't get a burr and I raise it, well now it's a 35 degree blade or a 30 degree blade. And now it totally changes the cutting, cutting ca characteristics of the plane. So for me then, it's important, because I use bevel up planes, to have this so that I can guarantee I'm going to get the same angle every time. Okay? So it's not slow, but what it is, is repeatable. Because the only thing you're trying to do when you sharpen, is you're trying to get two flat, highly polished surfaces that come together at an edge, repeatably. That's the part, repeatably. Okay? That's all you're trying to do when you sharpen. You could jig, no jig, uh, diamonds, oil stones, water stones, sandpaper, this concrete floor, or is this wood? It's wood. wood. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you could go out and get a rock from out there, and you'd be at it for a while, but you'd sharpen it. You just got to remember that fundamental. Two flat, highly polished surfaces that come together at an edge repeatedly. And then you'll never have a problem. So that's how I set up my plane. I think the surface turned out all right. And again, that plane was used all weekend in Harrogate. It was put in a plane sack and stuffed in that red box and traveled all the way from Harrogate down to here, nudged, bumped, thrown around. I pulled the plane out. It's got a PMV 11 blade in it and I don't do a thing to it, and I'm pulling off these shavings on top of being used for the entire weekend. So to me, I think it's worth it, but I'm just a lazy woodworker, so <laughs> who doesn't like sharpening? All right. Red stone or all these new diamond things, what, what's the best? I use a stone and oil for years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's trade-offs with everything, right? I personally use uh, I personally use water stones. Okay, um, I like water stones because they cut quickly, right? But the trade-off to that is that because um, the reason they cut quickly is that the binder that holds all the grit together um, wears away quicker, so that you're always exposing fresh grit, and that's what makes it cut fast. But the downfall is, is that they go out of flat quickly. So you have to flatten them more often. Oil stones, they don't go flat, uh, out of flat as quickly, but they take, longer to, um, they take longer to sharpen. And you also have to deglaze them and make sure that they're clean so that they don't pack up. So there's that downfall. Then you got diamonds. Generally, diamonds cut really well at the beginning, but as they age, they lose their tooth. And then your, your 600 becomes 1,000, becomes a 1,200, you know, and then you start to lose that. And then the other method is the, what's dubbed as the scary sharp method, which is basically a piece of glass with abrasives put on it, right, which I believe is what you guys do. Yeah, and so I always recommend to people, that's a fantastic way to start sharpening if you don't know this is your gig, right? 
if you start woodworking, you don't want to go and drop a few hundred dollars on Japanese water stones if you don't know that you're going to be doing that. So the beauty to that system is that it's always dead flat. You never have to mess around with that. The, the slight downfall to it is that you're using a consumable product. So you have to replace those once they get dull. And at some point, who knows how far down into the future, you will have spent more money on abrasive than you do on, on a stone, right? But I think for a hobbyist, I think you end up going quite a few years before that happens, don't you? And so my two favorite methods are the water stone and the sandpaper on glass methods. Wet and dry sandpaper. Sorry? Wet and dry sandpaper on the glass. Uh, yeah, you can, or you can use special uh, adhesive back papers that are specifically designed for sharpening. Uh, usually they're a mylar uh, backing. And then, um, you know, they're usually graded by microns. I know Lee Valley in Canada sells a 15, 5, and 0.5 micron mylar back paper that you can just drop on and then, you know, work with. Um, but you could, you, I mean, there's all, all methods of madness. You can get actual diamond paper, right? And that goes down to 0.1 micron or something. And I mean, they start getting really expensive. and they get very expensive. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's a certain point where there's diminishing returns. You know, you may get your blade a slight bit more keen, but after two or three passes, you're back to, you know, somewhere around the... Micron. Yeah. Yep. Which is pretty damn fine. Yep. And then we end the strop with a very fast foaming compound. That's right. Which is finer again on leather, so all these different methods work. It's just different principles behind it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, there's always a trade-off. There's not a perfect system that, you know, it gives you longevity, flatness, and, and speed. There isn't a, a, there isn't a way to do that. Has no, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> We're meant to try, though. Yeah. So, I mean, really, it, it's less about the media, quite frankly, that you're using to sharpen. It's more about the angles. As long as you remember that you're trying to put two flat surfaces highly polished together to form an edge, that's, that's the goal. Diamonds, sandpaper, water stones, oil stones, whatever. Great. Do what you want. But it's more important that you get those angles right. Any more questions? Please? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Arts and Media for being here filming it as well today. These will be going on YouTube later, so if you need to recap on what we've done, it'll be later sometime yet. Yeah. If not, Rick's obviously in Canada, so you can ring him at any time. Yeah, okay. yeah give me a call, we'll chat. If not, ring us. Ring us here, you know, we'll go through any of these bits with you. A lot of this kit we've got in the workshop as well, so come and try it. You know, as we said to you, the most important thing, does it fit your hand? Come in here, have a go with it. And the point is we use this kit all the time so we understand it. So. Come and have a go with it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. pleasure.